this first uh, sort of technical session in our uh, tutorial day today is about HPC I.O. and HPC storage. And what this really is is sort of a, a peek behind the curtain of what the big storage systems look like. Uh, maybe to provide a little context for some of the optimizations and tuning and tools that we'll be using later. So what is an HPC I.O. system? When we uh, say that today, we're talking about not just the hardware, but also the software. Um, there's a big pile of hardware, uh, probably thousands of disks in the class of systems that we're talking about. Um, and the software isn't just the file system that runs on them, but also the support libraries that go all the way up to your application and, uh, and help you get your science done. So there's a lot of reasons you might be doing I.O. in your applications. Uh, of course, we hope that most of it's productive, so you're trying to get your scientific results out or process your scientific data. Uh, there's also the case that you may be doing defensive I.O. Uh, so defensive I.O. is a checkpoint. You're uh, saving the state of your application periodically so if the system crashes or your job crashes, you'll have a way to get back to the place you were before. And then lastly, uh, analysis I.O. So you've already produced the data, you've run your simulation, now you're trying to churn through it and make the discoveries that, that you're really after. And how much data are we talking about? Um, this is a, a study from, let's see, a little over a year ago, about a year and a half ago. We took a sampling of some of the projects that were running on the ALCF system and looked at how much data they were reading and writing. And, that, you know, we learned a couple of things. Of course, uh, there's a lot of different science fields running on the Argon systems. This is just the top ten listed here. And they span kind of the gamut of different science uh, activities. And some of them are easily, uh, over a six-month span, reading and writing petabytes of data. Um, another interesting thing is we tend to think of uh, high-performance computing as being very write-intensive because you're writing these checkpoints, you're producing a lot of uh, science data and trying to store it. But we see a lot of read activity, too. So that's, uh, that's something that is a little bit of a surprise sometimes to computer scientists working in this field, but it is there. And what does the data look like? Um, you know, a storage system, an HPC I.O. system, or any storage system, generally just gives you files and directories. But that's not really what a, an application is working with. Uh, ideally, you'd be working with a data model that suits your problem. Um, so there may be multi-dimensional arrays, there may be hierarchical data, um, there may be image files, all sorts of things. And not only that, but you need to describe your data. So there's going to be headers and attributes to help you figure out what it was uh, when you come back to it later. So a big part of what we're going to be talking about today is how to make that transition from the, the kinds of uh, structures and data models you use in your science to what the storage system can understand. And doing that effectively is kind of, in a nutshell, the key to getting performance on these systems. So how do we do that? Um, there's, what this slide is showing is sort of two views of how you get from the application to the storage system. Uh, on the software side, uh, there's the application data model that you're trying to get to the storage data model. On the hardware side, you're trying to get from the, the memory that you have in each compute node down to your I.O. hardware. And, you know, the way, the way we looked at this uh, a few years ago was that this tended to be a manual uh, translation between the two, two layers of the stack. So an application would come up with its own data model, decide, well, I'm going to you know, put all my variables of this type here. I'm going to put all my variables of this type here. Um, it's going to be my own custom format. I'm going to write this into files on the software side. And, you know, on the hardware side, things were relatively simple. Um, you had some compute nodes. You had some storage nodes. You had a switch hooking them up. What we really see now is that people aren't so much um, coming up with their own data formats on the left side of this figure, but they're using libraries to help them generate these data formats. So this may be HDF, uh, this may be NetCDF, uh, this may be Adios. Um, there's, there's some other options out there. But these things let you focus more on, on your variables, your scientific data, and less about how you're going to organize it. Um, and then on the hardware side, things have gotten a little more complicated. Um, we tend to not just have one switch connecting the compute nodes to the storage hardware. Uh, there's going to be a fast internal network that the compute nodes use for your MPI communication. Uh, there's going to be some I.O. gateway nodes that transition you from that network to the network where the storage is. And then the servers aren't just 
computers with some hard drives in them. They tend to be more elaborate um, sort of RAID systems and big time storage systems to handle the, the volume of data. So because this hardware is getting more complex, does that mean the software has to get more complex? Um, of course, we hope not. Um, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So the, what we've done is try to put as much of the uh, kind of management of this into the software as we can so that applications aren't dealing with it directly. And just some examples of the software that you see here. At the top level, the things that the applications will interact with, of course, they can use just normal files if they want to, but uh, more commonly we see the use of data model libraries now. So the examples we have here are HDF, Parallel Net CDF, and Audios. Um, then at some point, the data produced by those libraries gets transformed uh, to optimize it on its way to the storage system. And the layers that tend to do that are going to be things like MPIO, which uh, Rob will be talking about. Um, there's other options like Glean, which is another Argon uh, software package, and PLFS, another DOE package. Um, and then on the way through to the storage system, something transfers the data from your compute nodes out to the storage system. And that depends on your platform. You may have an IBM product or a Cray product um, or a couple of other options there that are going to move your data off the system. And then finally, you get to the file system. And file systems, uh, there's a lot of options out there, too. We'll be talking about those a little more later. But this is kind of all the things that come together to get your data. When you say, I want to store this variable, these are the things that happen to get it to an actual disk somewhere. An example, um, I won't get into this too much because uh, we'll have some more depth on this later, but just to give an idea of what we expect application data to look like, um, you know, your application data structure may be a, a, a dense or a sparse, uh, alternatively multi-dimensional array, and there's going to be multiple variables, and when you go to translate that to a file, there's going to be a library that helps convert that into uh, where the data for each variable goes and aligning this and optimizing it so that it makes uh, makes good sense to the storage system when it gets there. So um, the next thing I want to kind of talk about in these in this slide deck is sort of uh, what's inside the storage system, particularly the hardware. Uh, for the most part, this isn't something you have to think about a lot, but it helps to kind of understand why we're doing the things that we're doing. Um, and we've put a lot of research and development into uh, making this easier to use. And we're, we're going to try and share that with you today. So how do HPC I.O. systems work? First of all, if you log on to Mira or any of the other systems and just do an LS, you'll see files and directories. They look the same as files and directories on your laptop. Um, the only difference is that it's coherent across the whole system. You log into a login node. You access it through Globus. Uh, you access it from your application. You see the same files and directories everywhere. So how, how, do, how is this organized? Um, you know, how do, how do we actually distribute this across the system, and how do we manage that concurrent access, and what sort of transforms do we need to do to kind of keep it humming, keep it going fast? And uh, the key thing that underpins all of it is the parallel file system. This is the piece that presents all those files and directories and makes them show up so that you can access them. And they're split into two pieces. There's the server side that actually runs where the hardware is, and there's the client side that runs where your application is. And the key thing is this uh, third bullet. Um, clients, which are processes in your application, can access the storage in parallel. They can all read and write to it simultaneously. And in fact, it's not just that they can do that. If you want to get the most performance, you have to do that in parallel. Um, if you have one process doing your I.O., um, you're going to have a bad time. You're just not going to get much out of the system. So it looks like any other file system, um, but there's some different properties and some different things you might want to do to take advantage of it. So uh, what, what to expect uh, in a nutshell? Um, when we're talking about a storage system that has, say, 7,000 or 8,000 hard drives in it, it has a lot more bandwidth than uh, you know, a conventional system. But any one of those hard drives is just the same hard drive you could go buy in Walmart or Best Buy. It's not fast. The only thing that makes it fast is that there's a bunch of them and you can use them simultaneously. So there's a lot more bandwidth that you have to read and write in parallel to make use of it. The second thing that can be a little bit of a surprise is that the latency is a lot worse than what you would see on a normal system. So on your laptop, you may open a file, uh, do a small read and write and close it, and it's instantaneous. There's nothing to it. 
but in the systems that we're talking about, there's a big path that we'll see in a figure in a minute between your application and the actual disk that you want to put your data on. So it takes some time to go back and forth. So once it gets going, it's very fast, but the time to do a small operation and come back is pretty bad. So this is what a lot of the software is trying to do, is take advantage of the bandwidth and try to hide the latency. And this is kind of a, the figure here on the left is an example of this. This is showing the, the bandwidth on um, our previous system, BlueGMP at Argon, as you change the request size in, in kilobytes. So if you start out with a four kilobyte request size, just every, every page of data you're trying to read and write, uh, you can see that the, this is megabytes per second. This is your throughput. This is very low. This is, looks like it's under 100 megabytes a second. So I mean, you can you can beat that on a on a disk drive that you order order off of a eBay right now. But as you get up to a big request size, a megabyte or larger, um, this particular application is getting over three gigabytes a second. So you've got to use you've got to access your data in big units to get as much out of the storage system as you'd like. Um, the second thing is that these systems tend to be sensitive to alignment. So if you have odd sizes, you know, prime number sizes, things that are kind of close to a power of two but aren't, um, you tend to see a lot of jumps in the performance that you'll get. So it can make a world of difference to get things that are, you know, a proper size for the file system versus things that aren't. And we'll talk about how to make that happen later. So this is a figure um, kind of showing the parallel file system pieces. Uh, so across the top, we have your application which is using a uh, client software which may be built into the kernel or built into a library to access the file system. Uh, that takes care of shipping everything over a, over a network and organizing it. On the back end, on storage nodes that you don't get to log into, there's uh, servers that are taking data from those clients and organizing it onto disk drives. And what's really happening, uh, you don't see it so much in this figure, but if you have one file, it's not going to go to just one hard drive on the system. The idea is to take that file and break it up into pieces so that if you read and write to a single file, you're going to use many, many hard drives at once, not just one. And what this really looks like, uh, this is an example of what a lot of systems look like today. Uh, the, this is not, <laughs> not drawn to scale, but the, the vast majority of the system is this big blue box, which is your compute nodes. Um, you know, you're, when you count it in cores, you've got hundreds of thousands of them, if not more. Um, some subset of them are called the I.O. forwarding nodes. They're the ones that are actually capable of talking to storage. So whenever these guys go to read and write data, it's first routed through a forwarding node that gets them to the outside world. Uh, there's a network. And then there's actual storage nodes themselves. That's where the server software runs. That's organizing your data. And then finally, your disk arrays. Um, disk arrays are quite large too. We're not talking about single disk drives, but you know, big big cabinets that have a whole lot of disk drives in them. And really, this this figure is pretty pretty representative of what you see on today's big HPC systems. But um, give it a year, and it won't look all that accurate anymore because there's yet another layer coming in here. Because uh, we're computer scientists, we add more layers you know, every time things get newer. So we'll, we'll talk about what the new layer is going to do, but that's a burst buffer to try and keep you from traversing all the way across this path every time you access data. We're trying to put some data, um, some storage resources a little closer to your compute nodes. This is sort of the generic kind of idealized, you know, what, is, what does the system look like? But, you know, of course, they're all a little different. Um, you look at systems at, uh, at NERSC, OLCF, and Argon, and also the NSA labs. Uh, there's a handful of different vendors. Not many, but there's a few different ones, and they make different different models every few years. Uh, the storage systems attached to them are no different. Um, if you look at the DOE facilities, there's three major parallel file systems in production use. IBM has a product called GPFS, or, or Spectrum Scale is the new name for it. Uh, Intel has a product called Luster, and Panassus has a product called PanFS. And each of these are a little different. They're subtly different. So it is possible to handwrite code that will do I.O. very fast on one machine and just optimize it, get the, the most out of it, and you copy your code to another machine and compile it, and it does not work well anymore. So that's one of the dangers of hand coding your own data formats and hand coding your own optimizations. Um, if you give more of this work to the software, software infrastructure on the system, then 
it becomes that software's problem to get the portability right across systems. So uh, Rob, myself, and others spend a lot of our time doing that, making sure that we build software that will work effectively across these different kinds of storage systems. So these, uh, these systems are getting complex. There's lots of different kinds, but you know we're trying to help you out with that, and that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, in particular, there's, uh, there's libraries that, as I was saying, try to take care of the performance portability to the degree they can. Um, we have some tools to help you understand I.O., to help you know if you have an I.O. problem, help you figure out where that I.O. problem is, if there is one. Uh, there's tools to help you transfer data from site to site. Uh, if you have allocations at multiple systems or, or you're transferring you know, analysis from one place to another. And we're going to try and share some best practices, things that um, you know, aren't so detailed tied to one machine, but just things that in general you know, are going to make your life easier.